Hello and welcome to episode 35 of React Native Radio. Today as our special guest, we have Yanni Evacolio. Hi there. And I'm your host, Nader Dabit. Yanni is going to be talking to us about a couple of things. Um, he works at a company called Futurist. And if you've been keeping up with React Native, uh, you may have seen a framework or a, um, I don't know if I would call it a framework, but a a bunch of um, UI elements and things that were put together for React Native called Pepperoni. And Futures also does a lot of uh, React Native uh, development, and Yanni's done some contributions to some different NPM modules and uh, different things uh, with React Native. So we're going to be talking all about that. So Yanni, uh, before we get into all of that, can you kind of tell us about yourself and how you got into programming and JavaScript and React Native? Sure. So uh, my name is Yanni Evakalil, and I'm currently the web engineering lead at Futurist in London. And I basically started making websites when I was like 10 or 11 years old. I was just a huge nerd and I didn't have any friends, but I did have a computer. So I uh, something to do. So I taught myself HTML and then some JavaScript and then this thing called ASP, which rests in peace. I hope uh, if any of you remember that, Hope you don't have to do that anymore. And then I eventually migrated into C Sharp and backend development and via many, many routes ended up on this career. So I mean, it was never something that I, I really thought would be a career for me. I, I went to study comparative literature when I, when I went to uni and I, I built some websites at night so just I wouldn't have to get a real job. And it turns out that there isn't that much of a career that you can have in comparative literature. And I was just too pragmatist to actually do it for the love of it. So I went and I had enough portfolio together so I could get a job as a programmer. And I've been doing that ever since. And for the past 10 years, I think I've been really into open web and open technologies. And I never really wanted to build mobile apps because I really couldn't handle the whole walled, walled garden aspect of mobile platforms because I always thought that it was much more valuable and worthwhile pursuit to try to break silos instead of instead of build and, and uphold them. But then about a little over a year ago, I got the opportunity to get um, on React Native really early and start building an app to production. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Very cool. So um, I guess with uh, Futurist, are you guys using React Native at your company? Yeah, we are. So we started here in London, basically with a couple of startups that we were working with, because the way of working that we we have with startups is is very co-creation like so we we work very closely together with them and both of these startups happened to have um like they wanted to first prototype and and uh, ship their like MVP out on on iOS and in London we were just getting started so we didn't have any iOS developers but you know these startups had a, a good uh, tolerance for risk and they really wanted to work with us so we decided to go go and try React Native. And now after those first two projects that we've verified that the platform works and it, it says basically what it says in the tin, uh, we've started to use it at, at our other customers as well. So our business is based in, in our, most of our business is based in Helsinki, Finland, and uh, we have offices in Berlin and Munich and London and Stockholm. And I think apart from Stockholm, all these offices are, are now building uh, at least uh, some React Native work. Some of the things that we kind of we, we wanted to do is take React Native into the enterprise and into household brands as well. And, you know, that was uh, in the beginning of it, it was a bit tough shell, but sell, but we, we managed to do that. And and here we are. So um, were most of your customers uh, existing like web customers or were you guys now starting to kind of market towards different clients trying to get not only web, but mobile customers as well or 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 is this kind of a um, evolution of your existing customer base well so i mean our company has i i think about 300 employees now and about 200 those are developers and we've basically done everything so we have a long history of building web apps but then also mobile native on all platforms uh, coming from Finland, Windows Phone is even a, is even a relevant platform for us. So, so we basically do it all. As to the customer base, we are using React Native at some of our existing uh, existing customers, but a lot of it comes from a need where we are starting to work with a new company with more of a design angle. So we have tons of uh, service designers and business designers, and we are trying to help our customers figure out like what could be a digital product that they can bring to market and make successful. And when it comes time to build that, quite often these days, it turns out that that is a mobile app. And one thing that I want to talk about a little bit also today is that even though we identified 
React Native as a good tool for building startup MVPs, but turns out it's actually a really, really good tool for larger companies and enterprises as well. And that shouldn't really come as a surprise to anybody, given that it comes from Facebook. Yeah, I agree. I think at the beginning, when we first started using React Native at our company, we didn't really feel like it was it was ready for like a enterprise type app. But I believe, you know, over the last year and a half, the evolution of the framework with all the contributions and all the bug fixes and this, the speed improvements, it's gotten to the point where it does have almost everything you would need. And whatever you don't need, of course, you can kind of just build it yourself if, if that's the case. So. Yeah, I mean, in the beginning when we started this, we were really fortunate in the sense that because we were doing the entire design and build of these applications, we could kind of design around some of the more difficult bits. So if something wasn't available for React Native yet or or some particular UI idiom or interaction seemed to be very difficult to make, we could just uh, we could just table that and um and and work around it. But now that we're working for bigger companies and they generally speaking have um a little bit of a more higher and exacting standard of what needs to be built, we've also needed to start scaling our React Native knowledge. So whereas in the beginning, you know, it was this was a tool for us that helped us work with customers when we didn't have native developers available. But now even our native developers are starting to kind of get into this and we have a couple of a couple of native advocates already, uh, people with a uh, long Android and iOS history who are really seeing the value in React Native and want to push that forward. That's pretty cool. That's really cool to hear that the native uh, developers are embracing React Native as well. Um, I think they would be the ideal developer because not only can they develop you know, cross-platform and JavaScript, they have the, the necessary skills to kind of make bridge modules over that typical uh, web developers couldn't do. So it seems like it would just be a fantastic opportunity for them. Yeah, I mean, so not all, of course, not all um, mobile developers can can do JavaScript, especially the kind of advanced React uh, architecture type things out of the box. And when we, we just had, I think uh, last month, we I, I went to Berlin where they, they host, like our office in Berlin hosts hackathons every every few months and most of them are native developers in berlin and they actually specifically request that they wanted to do one with react native and this pepperoni toolkit that that we have built and it, it was a really enlightening experience i felt because these people come with so much understanding of the platform that that i didn't have and they could identify instantly things that we are doing wrong or suboptimally but then for a weekend hackathon, it turns out that the amount of React and Redux and uh, all this fancy stuff that you need to learn is actually quite a hurdle. So I think coming from both sides of the uh, field, both from web and from native has its own disadvantages. And, and for us, we're starting to see that the best team is actually one where we combine you know, senior experienced people from, from both native development and web development, specifically React, and then you know, put those heads together. So when you're talking to a customer about a mobile app, do they know or do they even care how you guys are building it? So do you guys kind of go into whether or not you're using React Native or is it kind of a project and you look at it and you find the best tool and you just build it and all they care about is that it works? Oh, for sure they care. And I mean, there's a whole category of customers for whom this is still way too adventurous stuff. You know, think that you know we couldn't even imagine uh, imagine doing this for some of our customers, but for others, they are um, they they come from actually. There's a couple of different categories. There are the ones that um, are maybe building apps that aren't their core business, and they care more about getting it done. And when we explain to them what kind of advantages you can get from React Native in terms of code reuse and and efficiency uh, shipping across both major platforms, they're very excited about this because it, it really, on a high level, solves a core problem for them. And then the other category is essentially shops that have identified this problem a long time ago and have tried to solve it using previous generation cross-platform stuff like uh, Cordova, and they just haven't had a good experience with that. And, and for those companies, we've actually found that, that even mentioning the words cross-platform and JavaScript sometimes in the same sentence sends them into this weird shell-shocked state where they just don't want to even hear about it. But when we talk about this as a as a new iteration of a view layer and not necessarily even bring up the cross platformness they're very excited about the promises that the technology can make yeah i guess that makes sense without going too technical on someone that may have experienced some hybrid you know apps in the past that weren't really as performant as they would have liked just not going into all that would make a lot of sense i guess yeah i mean 
it's essentially it's very hard to some like you know explain in a in a quick two minute elevator pitch why is React Native that different from hybrid web framework? So why is React Native that different from uh, Xamarin or Qt? And and I think. I don't know if we want to go into it right now either. And I think most of the listenership here is already aware of these things. But fundamentally, I believe that this is the first time that we've had a viable cross-platform story um, for mobile development. So that's that's why we're kind of excited about this future is and, and, and why we're so eagerly advocating this to our customers. I know you kind of went over this a little bit, but I'd like to maybe hear a little more about this because I know a lot of the developers that are coming into React Native are coming to React Native from the web and the fact that you guys have um, been using it in a large company, uh, you know, with as many developers as you guys have. I guess the question is, as a web developer coming to React Native, how has the process been for them as far as moving from web development to mobile app development? And, um, you know, how easy has it been for them to kind of pick it up, I guess. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, in, in our company, we, we don't have that many web developers who had to kind of dive into React Native just by their lonesome without having previous experience and guidance. I think I w- might be one of the one of the only ones because I was early. And and I can speak from my experience in, in saying that that it wasn't always easy in the beginning. But then again, most of this is like just basic React development. There, there isn't fundamentally, if you know React and you know Flexbox and you know how to architect these applications in a way that makes sense and is is, is uh, scalable and maintainable using something like Redux or Mobex, then uh, there isn't really any reason why native applications at a high level should be difficult to make. But then on a lower level, there are a couple of things. So if you don't know Java or you don't know Objective-C, um, and when you hit a roadblock where you simply need a native integration to some other components, then that can be a bit Im- intimidating. And at least for me, I saw that process more like a like a just in time learning. I, I I wasn't ever really opposed to learning Java for Android or Objective C. It just that the the barrier to entry always seemed very very high. But with React Native, the cool thing is that you can actually build most of your application without going too deep into that, and then then just pick up things as you go. And it's a very empowering experience, I find, for, for for developers to actually be able to increase their reach and increase the value that they can generate for their employer or for their customer or for their own company by, by doing this. So it's definitely been a very cool and positive experience. And then when it comes to the rest of the teams that, that we've started um, working with React Native, there's always been like a person from a previous React Native team uh, such as myself, who comes there and kind of like can help that team to navigate the the rough waters. So uh, for for us, that process has worked very well. And I think the same is always said about, for example, teams that want to go into Haskell development. That you do need that one person with senior experience, and then the rest of the team can be very easily brought up. And that's our experience with React Native as well. So I guess let's go into uh, pepperoni a little bit. Um, can you kind of Explain what, I guess, what problems Pepperoni solves and kind of why you guys put this together and put it out there. Sure. So uh, Pepperoni is basically what we call like an application blueprint, which is just a fancy word for a boilerplate project. And well, the origins come from real customer projects. So the first couple apps that we built, we felt like between two of those, we were we were repeating a lot of the stuff. And because we are in a consultancy and the IP of the work that we create belongs to the customer, we can't really just copy paste that code from one project on to the next one. So we decided to solve this problem by just essentially investing a little bit into rewriting these this kind of scaffolding for the third time, but this time on our own cost and in our own name, so we can then start future applications from that. So, and, and another thing is that we needed to start scaling this knowledge internally because uh, I'm, I'm, we haven't done that many React Native projects. I believe the current count is five or six that we have worked with, but it's still too many for me to be personally having a finger in every soup. So we needed to start scaling the kind of idea of a best practice. And first we thought about writing documentation, but the fact of the matter is that nobody likes to write documentation and nobody likes to read documentation. So instead, we wrote this boilerplate project. And boilerplates are, I mean, they're a very difficult thing. If, if you look at the amount of React boilerplates, for example, just in the awesome React 
um, list. I think it, it's it's in dozens or even a hundred these days. And and the reason for that is that people always have opinions, and good boilerplates are always opinionated. So, and if you don't agree with those opinions, what people do is that they go and they write their own instead. Um, and we were very aware of this issue when we started working with pepperoni, and we decided, maybe a little bit controversially, that we wouldn't tr- even try to please everybody. That we would go very opinionated, and we would just essentially make something that makes futurist developers happy and productive, and makes our project more successful. And if somebody else can benefit from it, then that's great. Yes. Yeah, so, what are the what are some of the decisions that you would say are opinionated? Um, and I know there's just so many things to you know between testing and and then uh, data architecture and so on and so forth. But I guess can you go over a few of the opinions that you guys use and why you feel like those are uh, good for at least your company and why other people might benefit from from them as well? Sure. So, I mean, essentially our, our architecture on the skin of it is, is fairly vanilla uh, React Redux application. Uh, we use immutable JS for the, for the uh, store state. And, and that has been actually surprisingly controversial. We have a number of GitHub issues uh, where people request us to make a version of Pepperoni without Immutable or remove it entirely. For, for us, you know, it just makes total sense because in Redux state, you know, cloning your state is fraught with peril, but it's also highly unperformant and Immutable JS can help with that. Um, another kind of thing, a more niche thing, is that when you look at asynchronous actions in Redux or a side effects management in general, um, you know, the simple way of doing it is using something like Redux Promise and Redux Dunk. Uh, most people who want to level up from that go for Redux Sagas, which uses um, ES6 generators to create these kind of threads or coroutines. Um, when we tried that, we didn't really like it. We didn't feel like it produced great quality applications. And when uh, and, and definitely there's nothing wrong with that library. It's a, it's a fantastic piece of engineering, a fantastic piece of work, but it just didn't work well for our needs at that particular time. But what did work great is that in our company, we're all, uh, well, not all of us, but many of us are quite excited about Elm, the programming language. And the Elm architecture comes with this very specific way of executing side effects on on when your application uh, state mutates. And, and for that, there's this library called Redux Loop uh, that essentially implements uh, Elm style side effects in, in Redux. And we've used that for our asynchronous, asynchronous state and we'd be very happy with it. But because it is a more of a niche thing, uh, a lot of people don't really get it or see the value that it creates. I guess continuing off kind of what you were just talking about. So uh, people are complaining about like uh, immutable JS, for example. What if I what if I used your boilerplate and didn't want to use immutable? Is it pretty easy just to not use it, or is it? I mean, it's a dependency, but it's not really forced, is it? No, absolutely. I mean, like if you know how Redux applications are built and wired in, it shouldn't be more than a ten minutes exercise of remo- remove immutable JS from the code base. But here we've actually something that we discovered uh, that we didn't really expect at all is that when people start a project from the boilerplate, they sometimes seem to have an expectation that they, they can keep upgrading this boilerplate into a newer version within their application. And if you do rip out, uh, rip out immutable JS, it does become a lot harder to merge upstream changes back into your own repository just because you're touching more uh, integral pieces of the code. But this is something that really surprised us that people even want to do this. We never really considered this, but but now that we have come you know, aware of this, we are thinking of ways how we can make this easier in the future. And, and in general, uh, another opinion that, that we had specifically is that we decided to include a authorization component into the application using uh, this cloud service called Auth0 that implements basically authentication and identity management for you, uh, including the sign up and login UIs. And for us, that's just like a no brainer because a lot of the apps that we work with, it would usually take like at least a couple of weeks to write the front end and back end for a, for a good login sign up experience and because the auth zero one is decent we decided to plug it in there but it, it isn't actually as versatile as one might think and our our approach in our own projects has been to just rip it out from from the project if we don't need it because it's easier to remove something than it is to add it but it seems that for most of the people who are using pepperoni in the wild including all these services from the get go is just adding too much confusion so we are trying to figure out a way to still keep our opinions and still make our own developers happy and productive but make it a lot easier to remove this stuff 
Yeah, I love Alt Zero. Alt Zero is awesome. But you know, I've tried to implement Alt Zero with React Native. I only tried it one time, and it was about a month and a half ago, and I couldn't get it to work. Did you guys have much issue getting it to work? And has it been a pretty good experience implementing authentication with Alt Zero? Um, yeah, we didn't have any problems implementing it. There are a couple of uh, problems with it. For one, the iOS library doesn't uh, allow you to customize the colors and the look of the login screens. So we did have to fork Auth0 and we are shipping Pepperoni with a link, uh, with uh, the dependency of a futurist fork of Auth0 that adds this capability. And, and then there are cool. some weird, weird things about the authentication. Um, error handling in things like poor network conditions and not being perfect. But generally speaking, if your level of requirement is such that you can use out-of-the-box solution, um, it's, it's, it's been very useful for us. So um, I'd like to hear a little more about Redux Loop. I've been pretty interested in Elm as well. Um, and I know this is kind of off topic a little bit, but I know it is included with Pepperoni. Yeah, what, what does Redux Loop do? Is it kind of something to let you do some type of uh, API calls and middleware? Or uh, with Redux, or what, what? What exactly does it do? Yeah, so the Redux loop is essentially it's a, it's a middleware, or in fact, it's actually a store enhancer that um, allows you to uh, instead of returning uh, the next state from your reducer as you do normally in a Redux application, you return the state, but then you can also return an effect or effects. An effect is essentially a descriptor of what you want to happen. Uh, in conjunction to this state update. And the great thing about this is that when you're testing your reducer code, what you get is your next state, but you also get a descriptor of these effects. So um, testing asynchronous code or code that will execute side effects on, on, on things that are harder to test, you can just test that you're returning the right descriptor and you don't have to worry about uh, mocking services or, or orchestrating any kind of asynchronous code. Um, and another, I think the huge biggest value for me using Redux Loop is that it co-locates the things that I want to understand um, together in, in, in a way that when I look at Redux Saga, and if you imagine it's it's like a tennis match, like I'm, I'm looking left to see the one, you know, one, one um, side effect being executed and then I'm looking right for the, for the reducer to execute and then the next and the next and the next. Whereas with um, with Redux Loop, I always feel that I can I can read the code from top down and I can understand the flow of the of the program. So that's the biggest thing for me. So um, how long did it take you guys to kind of put this all together and get it up on GitHub? Like uh, like kind of go through the process. Was it um was it something you kind of or like you said you kind of already had an idea, but then you had to actually package it and build the website? Like you know how long from idea to actual release? Well, so and, and this is somewhat embarrassing, I feel, but I think the total engineering work put into Pepperoni, uh, not counting uh, triaging issues and, and uh, emergency and pull requests is probably a total of two weeks of, of my time and uh, some other t- uh, time of other members of our team. So for us, it's been, it's been um, quite a simple process. But essentially, the hard work here wasn't typing up this code that we have in place. The hard work was... Um, building a couple of applications and trying to figure out what works and what not. So that's where the where the value comes from. And for example, you, um, we have a website at getpepperoni.com. And the, the funny thing about that website is that when we made this, we, we launched it internally to use it in inter- internal projects. And we had an idea that we wanted to also see if we could um, we, if the community would be interested in this and if some of our customers would be interested in this. So we decided to build this basic website that just describes on a high level um, what it is so, so we could show it, uh, show it to our, some of our customers and friends to get feedback. Um, and then I went on holiday um, and, and uh, our highly effective and excitable uh, marketing, marketing team decided to actually launch this in a, in a bit bigger way than we expected. So we pushed it on Product Hunt, we pushed it on... Um, on Hacker News, and I believe I was somewhere in Andorra, um, the only only place on my trip that I didn't actually have um, have a roaming internet. And I suddenly get a call from some reporter from a uh, from a digital magazine uh, magazine asking for a uh, comment on this thing. So I go and I check up the Pepperoni reposit- repository, and it's trending on GitHub, and it has two thousand stars. So that soft launch kind of backfired. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, but I, I think it just tells like how much actual need there is and how much actual sort of 
I don't know, like demand there is for ideas about how to build React Native applications. Because there's a tons of React developers who who can do React apps, and they maybe suffer from a bit of crisis of confidence on whether or not you know same ideas are actually you know working on on mobile. And then there's tons of people who just want to build their first mobile app and they come up with this thing, uh, React Native, that they feel like solves a lot of their problems, but they don't know how to get started. So so there definitely is demand. And hopefully now towards the end of the summer, uh, we'll have a bit more time to actually execute on the roadmap that we have defined for Pepperoni and the things we want to include in it. Yeah, very, very, very interesting and a very cool project. I think there definitely is a need for things like this. Um, I know I've heard the biggest question i seem to always see and get as far as uh, these types of projects are like a ui kit or a ui framework um and also something like this so those two things seem to be very and very much in demand I always uh hear things like you know we want uh you know a group of ui elements like material or something similar or bootstrap you know where is that i know there's a few things out there but nothing it seems to be like the dominant thing that people use. And then, and then also like boilerplates um, other than just the blank starter project you get from React Native. And I think this is a really, a really good option for someone, even if you're kind of like getting started with React Native and you want to kind of see how a large company would go about structuring a complex application with all the pieces like, you know, testing and, 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 arch- and data architecture, just downloading the project, running it, you know, looking at dependencies is definitely a good place to start. I guess, Yanni, with Auth0, when they download the project, do they need to configure their own personal Auth0 account, I guess, with with Pepperoni? Um, yes, they do. But I mean, that's just a question of uh, clicking through the sign up form on Auth0 and copy pasting the authentication code in the config file. So that's as, as easy, uh, how easy it is to get started. We were thinking of in, like uh, getting like a low-level paid plan and just putting that in there, um, so people can kind of get started. But we figured that people might accidentally end up shipping that into production, and that would not be very cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but it, it, yeah, in terms of odd zero, uh, I, I know that you know this is a React Native podcast, but I feel like. You know, there's so many of these services right now, such as Auth0, that just make software development these days finally seem that the, the the kind of like the Lego pipe dream of software development is is coming to be feasible. Something like Auth0, we we're using it in uh, in a, in a few places, not only with uh, with React Native apps, but also regular web apps. And it's such a time saver for such a mundane hygiene feature that most companies and most products don't actually want to spend time building, but they they get this kind of free out of the box. And Future is being a consultancy that focuses on on product. Uh, We are definitely a very high quality uh, software engineering team. But for us, like we're starting to believe more in in building of the product, and what what makes what makes a product successful usually isn't the login screen or the sign up screen. As long as the flow works and it doesn't drop you off conversions, you're good to go. And and other things like you know we're using we're using services for uh, dashboards and and such, uh, which just make it a lot easier to deliver that value without building tons of custom software. Yeah, absolutely. And um, for people listening that aren't too familiar with Alt Zero, you can use it to do email login, but you can also use it to do Facebook and Twitter and uh, Gmail and all the different OAuth and authentication, and it's fairly oh, wow. easy to set up. And not only that, the, the most fantastic thing about Auth0 that we've discovered is that you can do a fingerprint authentication on iOS and you can do passwordless authentication over email and SMS. So essentially, if you want an authentication system where user just gives their email or their phone number and they do all the sending of the email or message for you and handle the, uh, handle the authentication on the back end. Oh, wow, that's awesome. I didn't even know that they did all that. I know that's, that's about a month's worth of work that's uh, right there. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a full time full time engineer's amount of work to um, to maintain that. So very cool. So I know you're also involved in the React Native project, or or maybe some other React Native uh, modules. I see I see you on GitHub. So like, where do you think React Native is kind of headed in the future as far as adoption and um, like growth and things like that? Do you? I mean, just out of out of curiosity, kind of do you see companies? picking it up and, and larger companies starting to accept it. And, um, you know, I, I've seen that personally um, 
it's starting to gain even more momentum. But I'm kind of curious, you know, someone in um, in London and Europe, you guys have other types of customers um, and you see different things. I'm just kind of curious where you see React Native headed uh, in the future. Sure. Uh, so first, sake of transparency, so nobody um, accuses me of, of uh, talking myself too much. I do have some contributions to some uh, React Native projects and also I think one commit to the React Native core project. But I, I, I'm more of a jobbing programmer. I, 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 In fact, I take pride on the fact that I am way too busy and uh, poorly organized most of the time to actually meaningfully contribute to large scale open source open source projects. I, I feel a lot, a lot of people feel that they are, like that makes them somehow less worthy. And if, if I look at the list of people that you've had here on this React Native radio podcast, it certainly feels uh, a little bit like, what am I doing here among all these other people? But but getting to your question about where I see React Native going from a jobbing programmer's point of view, meaning somebody who isn't overly deeply inside the the like playing inside baseball but somebody who's just doing this for uh for a living on day to day i i feel like the promise of react native has always been a very attractive one to the to the to our customers be they small or large but there's been a certain amount of hesitation just because it's a new piece of technology because it always comes with risk to do something daring and, and adventurous like this and essentially the only way i think to ethically from a consulting or a product uh, business point of view to throw in with something new like this is just to go and do it. And that's what we've been doing. We've been building um, internal open source apps for events. We're helping um, Save the Children, uh, the charity, to pro bono to build uh, one of their apps in Finland with React Native, just so we can get more experience, so we can get more confident in telling our customers whether or not this is a, this is a good piece of technology. And so far, all, all um, signs point to hell yes. Cool. I couldn't agree more. Another question. What about you personally? What do you have in your future as far as your career and things like that go? Well, so I think React Native kind of coming along and me starting to develop on it a year ago was it was a very interesting boost for my personal career and just name recognition. Uh, I think, in fact, after I, I, I talked at a meetup um, at Facebook, uh, I think a week later, I was recognized in a pub in West London by some random person who came and congratulated me on my uh on my on my great talk, so it's kind of like really <laughs> weird this kind of celebrity thing, uh, and I use the word celebrity with air quotes and with much much irony, but it, it's it's undeniable to to just to say that you know like I am uh, you know my career has certainly gotten a boost by riding this wave and 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 you know hitching my star to the to the right wagon or hitching my wagon to the star I think I believe that's the that's the one. So yeah, I hope I, my plan is to double down on working with React Native. Um, in fact, Lena, you asked from a personal point of view. Um, so personally, I'm actually moving on from Futurist uh, this autumn. I'm, I'm joining uh, Formidable Labs, which you might have heard of. Um, they're Absolutely. like it's, yeah, they're a Seattle-based company. Uh, they specialize in React and Node, and they're pretty big in React ecosystem. They built Radium for inline styles and Spectacle for presentations and and Victory for charts. And now they're porting Victory for React Native. And and they want to uh, set up shop here in London. So I'll be leading that team, and we're going to start building a more React Native-focused mobile shop here in London. So what kind of uh, work is that going to be? Is it going to be also... Um Similar to what you're doing now, where you guys take clients and, and you build like enterprise type and business apps. Well, I, I hope that there will be a wide mixture of work. I mean, so far, uh, as I understand it, Formidable Labs has been working on React Native uh, quite a bit as well, mostly driven by Ken Wheeler, the uh, inimitable Ken Wheeler, and and they are uh, they're, they're using it at Walmart to build consumer facing apps that ship to tons of people. So definitely, you know, like they have experience in it and we hope to scale that to, to, you know, any, any kind of customer. I, I don't yet know what the adoption here in London will look like, but knowing the, the kind of companies that are here, I would imagine would be doing exciting work in, in multiple different fields. So, um, you came on to Formidable. Are you going to be working, I guess, um, remotely or do they have like an office where you, you are? Uh, so we're going to be setting up an office here in London, uh, somewhere in this East London hip old street uh, area. But we, we don't yet have a space and everything is a little bit in flux, but we're definitely uh, looking for a great space and a great team and uh, being remote friendly, but you know, definitely building a local team here in London as well. 
So I guess you guys are, are, are doing some hiring right now? We are. We're getting started. Um, I am the first uh, first member of the London team to join right now. So um, I, I will will really kick uh, kick things on in uh, in October when most of the uh, or a large part of the uh, formidable team is coming to visit from Seattle and and uh, we'll be speaking at uh, some local events and and doing uh, doing things like that. So yeah, for the rest of the year, that's our our goal is to build a kickass team and ship some React Native apps. Awesome. Well, um, I think that we can go ahead and get to the picks now. Um, so do you have any picks for this episode? Yeah, sure. I, I think I could go with the classic. Back in February when they had the React Conf in Silicon Valley, James ID uh, from Exponent did this amazing talk uh, called Team X Technology or Team, Time, Team Times Technology about the kind of, you know, team innovation and the an organizational um Organizational benefits you can you can get from building full stack uh, full stack JavaScript and full stack React, and that's been very inspirational for us. You know, building these teams and 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 uh, shipping software. So I, I do recommend, even though it already does have a uh, six thousand views on YouTube, I think there's a few listeners here who might not have seen it. So definitely worth watching. James ID Team Times Technology. Oh my gosh, that is like one of my favorite talks of all time. I think <laughs> that's so funny that you mentioned that talk. It, it's yeah, a classic one on that talk. It's awesome. It will leave you in, inspired, and also, it's a really good. Um, he, he's such a good presenter. If you if you are someone that is going to be giving a talk and you want to watch someone that gives a very good, you know, professional talk, uh, just watch that and um, and copy what he did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I did a talk at Facebook London in January, and I was pretty happy with myself. And then I saw this talk, and I was like, oh my god, still in the farm leagues, bro. <laughs> Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, uh, my, my pick is going to be a book that just came out on Meep, which is the Manning Early Access Program. So basically, you can um, download the book uh, as it's written. It's uh, Elm in Action. So it's uh, basically two chapters are available. But um, if you're looking for um, a nice place to go ahead and have a book to read about Elm and some of the, the more up-to-date techniques and um, things going on in the Elm language, I would highly recommend this book. So it's called Elm in Action. It's uh, by Richard Feldman, and it's from Manning Publications. Yeah, I'll have to plus one that. Rich Feldman, all his talks and all his technical writing is just brilliant. And I've, I've learned everything I know about Elm, I've basically learned from him. So um, very cool. I didn't know that book was out. Awesome. Yeah, it just I think it just was released Friday, which was, uh, I guess, July 20-something <laughs> for uh, anyone listening. So. Okay, awesome. Well, Yanni, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I think we uh, we covered a lot, and it was a really uh, great having you on. And maybe in the future with the Formidable, we can have you back on, if that's okay. Yeah, that sounds cool. It was really fun to chat with you, Natter, and I'll be back anytime you invite me. Awesome. Well, uh, that wraps up episode 35 of React Native Radio. We'll, we'll see everyone next week. 